What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here to tell you about remote data. It's time to data. Programming, gaming, fitness. Jesse Warden. What is remote data? Why does it matter? Remote data is any data that comes from outside of your world. JavaScript, Python, Java, C, whatever languages we're talking about, they run in some environments, right? You can create data within it and access it there, whether it's in RAM or whatever else. But once you have to go outside that realm and get things from text files, XML files, databases in the cloud, the number one source of bugs is when you get data that doesn't quite fit your view of the world and your programming compilation controls and things go boom. It's the number one place of errors, so it's very important to understand how that works, how you can protect yourself. Any application you do pull data from some remote source of truth. What is the data? If we're building a dashboard, where does that come from? If you're doing email, it's all from an email server, whether you access on your desktop or your phone. The point is that remote data is in some location that you're gonna get to show. All applications deal with remote data in four basic ways. They're called CRUD. You create it in your application or somebody else creates it and you look at it you read it, display it on the screen, modify how it looks, do some filters from a dashboard, drill down, same data, but shown different ways. You can update that data, take some data and update it, modify it. If you're doing a Word document or a paper you're writing or Excel spreadsheet of your finances and expenses and taxes, those kind of things you'll update and then delete. Sometimes data is old, you'll delete it, modify it, and then save it back, whether it's in a text file or it's in a remote database. So that's what we're talking about today, remote data, things outside the realm. We're gonna read it locally from text files, XML files and JSON files and show you a node. The same code we've been doing in all the past tutorials. The only difference is we're gonna use node because it's simple to run locally and play with local things without worries of complicated security restriction. There's always a parsing step. There's always a minuscule amount of code that has to be written to translate it from some remote place to you. Remote being on a server or your desktop local machine or your phone, it's reading locally from the phone. The point is it's not created by you in RAM in your application's environment. It's from some random place and it comes in and you have to translate it. All right, we're using Node to code JavaScript locally to play with data. It's a lot simpler to play with local files and local things using Node rather than the browser because the browser has security restrictions. It doesn't want bad people doing things to your machine. It wants to have a sandbox that's safe for data that you access over the internet, bank, things like that. So we're going to go around the sandbox called Node and it allows us to do all kinds of things. Search for Node. You'll see this thing called Node.js. If you go to Node.js.org, it should detect your OS and allow you to download whatever one you want. I always like the, the stable because the stable means it reasonably works well, right? They've tested it. So in this case, download it, install it. Whether you're on Windows or Mac, as soon as you open your terminal here, you should be able to type in the word Node and it should enter a prompt, right? Some kind of place where you type. So it's not a normal prompt. To get out, it's Control C, same for Mac and PC. Press it twice, you're out, good to go, you're back in the safe world. Now, if you're on Windows, you can do DIR to figure out where you are. If you're on Mac, you can say PWD, right? It tells me exactly what folder I am in. So in our case, we're gonna do Node, and we're gonna play just like we would in a browser. This is almost the exact same thing I did on my very first tutorial showing you how you code in a browser. We're doing the exact same thing in the terminal. All the basic JavaScript you've already learned, guess what, you already know, you can already do it here. Amazing, awesome. I am so strong, I can go to different environments, learning the same language, right? In the past, you didn't get to do this. Now you can do JavaScript client side, server side, in the cloud, all kinds of places. Var cal equals moo, semicolon, plot out, returns undefined because it's return values, right? Very similar to the browser. Actually, it's almost the exact same if you're using Chrome because it runs on the V8 engine. So we type in cal, it gives our variable cal moo, right? So just like you've been coding the browser, node is a very similar place, except you're not in a browser, you don't have security restrictions, so we can make Ajax calls. Rather than doing this, let's start writing some files. Instead of this, let's exit out of here, let's create a folder on our desktop and start creating some code. So I'm gonna create a folder called basic node, I'm gonna go inside of there, and then I'm gonna open that guy inside of Sublime. All right, we have a basic node, now let's create a basic file. In this case, we're gonna call it index, very similar to index.html, index.js is the default file that when you open folders it looks for, or you can name it whatever you want. I don't really care, I'm just gonna call it index.js. Save it in our basic node folder. So we'll do the exact same code we did, Bar Cal, it was moo, gone so long. We're coding JavaScript, it looks just like JavaScript, it just runs in a different place. In outer space, not really outer space, more like command line space. Not necessarily the final frontier. Let's cd to our directory. It's the same thing, 
on Windows as it is on Mac. You CD to the folder. Mac, for the most part, is case sensitive. Windows, sometimes you can get away without being case sensitive. It could be documents and settings or documents and settings. In my case, it's desktop slash basic node. And if you hit tab, it'll often autocomplete. I can't remember what Windows does. LS and for Windows it is uh, DIR, I think. It'll tell you what files are actually existing in the folder. I only have one index.js. Now, if you pass a file to Node, when I say pass a file, so if I say Node index.js, it'll say, hey, Node, run this file. Rather than run this JavaScript, go ahead and run the JavaScript in this file. Think of Node index.js as if I were to write the function Node a file, right? If a file does not equal undefined, then run the A file. Else, run node and let me code manually. Right, it's the same thing. So when you think of command line arguments, that's what we're saying. So node, yo bro, can you run this index.js file? And hit enter, he'll go boom, and he runs it. And it actually prints out whatever you console.log. So in this case, I printed out cal equals move. Same thing as we've been doing before. You can keep doing this. I'm gonna hit Control K to clear it. I forget what the command is for Windows. Deal with some in RAM data, okay? So we're gonna create some people. And let's make an array. It's not just an array, it's an array. First name, Jesse. Last name, Morton. Job. He is the chanter of the group. First name, Randy. Last name, Fortune. She is the mage of the group. Last name, Moo. Cow is the fighter of the group. Okay. And we'll console log out our people. Say, people. Who are you? Hit up on the keyboard. It'll cycle through all the list of commands you've written in the past in the terminal and or command line. You can then hit enter. So it's a quick way to go up, enter, instead of retyping the command again. I like shortcuts. Notice it prints out my array, right? The actual JavaScript data we created. It's the exact same thing as the browser. If I were to take this code and copy pasta coding, copy pasta for the win. If we then paste this in the console and hit enter, it runs the same code. We can then inspect it. Notice the inspector in the browser is so much better than in the terminal. There are plugins for the terminal, command line to do that. I don't have them installed because I like buttons and GUIs. But just so you know, they're there for you. Cool. So, so far you feel comfortable. We're coding in Node, coding in the browser. Not much different, right? One has a better way of console logging. The other is a lot faster and doesn't have security restrictions. So far, so good. But let's talk about what if we wanted to save this data that we actually created. Let's read and write some text files. In order to do that, we have to use a module that knows how to do that, or a library. Now in the browser, we've been doing things like this. Script, source, some library we downloaded from somewhere, right? And we close the script tag. Node has a better way of doing it. You can actually import modules. And we'll go over modules later at a later point to give you a better introduction to Node. But for today, we're just doing basic data. In this case, we're gonna go a variable, just like we normally would do. But in this case, we're gonna require it and say, hey, Node, go get it. And you'll notice this FS, or whether you use single quotes or double quotes, doesn't matter, I do double quotes and single quotes to mess with people's minds, keeps them on their toes, right? Strange management technique I learned. What it allows you to do is read and write the file system. FS stands for file system. Two letters, right? It makes sense. So in this case, this FS is this file system variable. But unlike other variables, it has a lot of cool things it can do. And it often is asynchronous, so it's gonna deal with callback mechanisms. We're gonna use this guy, say, hey, file system, we need you to write to the file system. Can you do that? And he's like, well, I'm the file system, I can write to the file system. Fantastic, I'm glad you're here. Let's get to work. We're gonna do this method called write file. It takes three parameters. The first is, where are we writing it? What's where, what's the file name? What's the folder path? Blah, blah, blah. So we're gonna do dot slash test.txt for test.txt file. Same on PC, same on Mac, good to go. Notice we're doing forward slash, not backward slash. We're doing it Unix, keeping it web, keeping it real. That's what we're doing. Second is the contents. The content has to be text, basic text. Pronounce words, Jesse. 
Okay, great. And lastly is our callback function. This is, hey, when it's done, I'm gonna let you know, I'll call a function. You can be a function and I'll call it when I let you know. Sometimes file system saving is instantaneous. Other times it may take a while. So well, let me just give me a function, I'll call you when I'm done. Oh, by the way, and if I mess up, I'll send you an error along for the ride. Assume that it has an error because we always code defensively. So we use a function as a third parameter and we say, all right, cool. If there's an error, now you'll see a lot of people do er, right? Er, I don't like that. I'd like to say error because that's what it is. If error, let's, uh, let's console error it out. Boom. Connor 8, Captain. And we'll print out that error to see what it is and then we'll return to actually exit from the function. But assuming everything went well, console.log, we wrote it, yo. Technically it wasn't we, it was all FS, but let's, you know, pretend it's a we thing. We're working together on this. So we save it and let's run this mofo up into one handed. We wrote it, yo. Hey, that's fantastic. Let's prove that it actually wrote. Oh, looky there. A test.txt file is currently residing in our folder locally. Let's uh, double click this guy and open it. Hey, what do you know? It's what we wrote. Congratulations, you accomplished the C, C, C in CRUD. You have created data and saved it locally. You are amazing. Let's do the same thing with our JSON. Now, you cannot save objects in text files. That's not how it works. What you do is you save text. Text files are text, unless you read and write text. For you to save it, you gotta convert your JSON to string. Thankfully, there is a JSON converter that exists both in Node and in browser, because again, it's V8 engine. Let's see in the browser. Let's clear out our log here. Clear. Whoosh. We'll see JSON. It has two methods. It has a stringify and a parse. Stringify says, hey, take this JSON and make it a string. Parse says, take this stringify JSON and make a JSON. In and out, in and out. Pretty simple stuff, pretty rad. We have the same exact class available here and it's global, meaning you don't have to import it or require it or do a script tag or whatever. So in our case, we're gonna take out this and we're gonna say JSON stringify. That is such a Jesse Warden word. I love they named it that. We'll save it. We will, to be fair, delete our text file so we're not cheating. Rerun, we wrote it, yo. Cool, so far so good. Let's double click this text file it wrote. Hey, what do you know, it's our JSON. Now what happens if we wanna read that back out at a later date, maybe use the code later? Well, let's figure that out. Let's create a new file here. We'll save it as read text file. To read a file, we're gonna use our main dude, the file system again, he's still there. But in this case, instead of write file, we're gonna read file, okay? And let's uh, let's kill this whole function so we can start from scratch. right? Read a file. What are we reading? Where are we reading it from? What's the folder path? Same order, right? In this case, it's dot slash. It means right here, right now, Fatboy Slim style. Test.txt. So we're gonna read it. The second parameter is weird and it should default, but whatever. We're gonna say UTF-8. All that means is how is the text encoded? There are different encodings. It just means there's a standardized way that the entire world of computers, Japanese, Chinese, English, Jesse, can all talk to each other in the same general language. And that's good. We can support basic ASCII characters like A, B, C, D, and one, two, three, as well as emoticons, as well as double byte characters those neat little dots that some Europeans have on their names that I love, all that kind of stuff. Right? So UTF-8 allows us to talk like that. That's what that is. Their parameters, what? That's right, callback. The difference, however, is that if it did find it, it'll give us the data of that file for us. So we can check it out now. If an error occurred. Oh, bad English, Jesse. Bad English. If an error occurred, console.error. Booms. Technically we should be using log here. Let's do log because we're more interested in the errors and we want it to operate that way. The error does weird things when you try to do commas with it. So let's just do that. Return. If we got data out, let's print it out and see what it looked like. The data looks like this. Save it. Node read text file. Yes. Cool. So it read the data out, it printed out an array. That's cool, but that data looks like JSON and JavaScript, but it's not. It's actually text. The way we get it back 
is to parse it out. Now, before we parse it, let's play with it real quick. Let's show you what happens when you try to try to play with data that you think is JSON but isn't. And this is where 99% of bugs in almost all software I've written have ever come from. It said, oh, this data is good. I found it from a good place. I trusted him. He washed his hands. He seemed like a good hygiene individual. Clearly, this data is good, right? Wrong. So we'll say length since this data is an actual array, right, of people. Run it out. 169. Hmm. I'm pretty sure there were three people, not 169. What that is, is the length of the string. <laughs> that is not the length of the array. <laughs> so it is a string JavaScript object. So let's parse it back out. Let's go our parsed data is JSON parse, right? Takes strings that look like JSON and parses them out. So we'll say data and take our parse data and then show that length. Save, up, enter, rerun, plot out three. Right now we actually have our data. We can show our parse data. Show what it looks like, save, up, enter, rerun, plot out. Now we actually have a JavaScript array that is a real JavaScript array. Good to go, so far so good. Congratulations, you've now done the R. Crap, I always do that backwards. The R, how do you do that? There we go, R in crud, well done. You've now got the create data and save in it. You have read it back out and parsed it out. So you've done two operations. Oh God, you're killing it today. Cool, so now it's time for the U and crud, because update whatever let's create a new file save it out and call it update text file we actually use proper english this time instead of txt down with the leap bro copy pasta coding all right so we're gonna take our original data right that we had at the very top so in this case we're going to read the file out and instead of parsing it we're going to actually add an additional user and then write that at the bottom so we're going to have some little fun with this. Let's create a git random name. And we'll say the random name is cow math dot, I don't know, random or something, times 999. 999. Let me show you how you can play with code in Node. So there's this thing called module exports. You can put whatever you want on it. My suggestion to keep things simple and easy, regardless of what all the tutorials tell you. Cause they're like, you can put everything you want on it, bro. You can put like numbers and strings and JSON and objects and arrays. Don't do that. Just put an object, put functions on that object. <laughs> it keeps it really simple. So get random name is get random name. Watch this. We can go to node. We can actually play with it, right? And we can say var testing equals require dot slash means get my module from right here. It's the same thing as if you were to do a source tag in the browser, because it's right here. So you say require dot here, our update dash text file JS. And JS is optional, you can just do that, or dot JS, it's up to you, whatever. So we have testing, right? Prints it out, it has one function on it, get random name. So we're gonna see what get random name actually does. Let's test it before we actually run it. Okay, so it gives us a really strange name. Let's get rid of that, uh, that value. Let's random, let's floor it. So we get rid of the decimal. So uh, now you'll notice what I have to do is I have to exit out because even though I've updated the code, the code's loaded in RAM. So for example, if I go var testing equals require, actually it's right there. Hit up, right, then testing, good to go. Then testing random name, hit enter, cal521, that's fine. If I were to add random stuff to it, like let's say zzzz, save, Right, and then rerun the function, you'll notice it's not changing. That's because the code is actually loaded into RAM. So if you want to reload it, you just exit out of node and then up again, and then rerun your functions. Good to go. Cool. So I've got random names being generated. So I've got random names. Let's get a random job as well. Get random job. In this case, we'll do, I don't know, jobs array plumber cheese muffin maker this is a healer and finally we have a jumper we will then get a random job a random job is jobs dot length we're gonna have spell mr warden times math dot random 
And we will floor this. Math.floor means round down. So we get a random number from zero to three. And we will return a random job. So I'll, I'll test this out real quick so you can see it. So we're not gonna add another function and play with it. It's fun. Let's exit out again. Since we've added new code, node. And test random name still works, good to go. In this case, let's do get random job. Cool, one, three, zero. Right, it's always a random number of zero, one through three. Four items in the array. Zero is the first item, one is the second, two is the third, three is the fourth. Cool, so, so far so good. Let's clear that out. We got a random job, let's actually return jobs, random job index, so we can get random jobs. So if you run the same code again, node, up, 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 pow, up, up, pow. Cheese muffin maker, jumper, plumber, cheese muffin maker, right? Get us a random job, cool. So now, the last thing we can do is for the last name, we'll just get another random name for the last name, okay? So say get random person. What's a random person? A random person is a JSON object that has a first name with a random name, a last name that is also a random name, and a job that is random as well. Cool, so far so good. Let's test this guy out. You notice we are constantly testing our code rather than wasting our time. Sometimes you get lost in the code and you wanna code for hours before testing it. And I, I understand that and sometimes you need to do that. You need to lose yourself in the moment. That's great. Getting in the zone is a powerful place, but I highly encourage you to test it as you build it. It'll result in a lot less frustration and you will confirm the basics work. All right, so in this case, we never caught it before. We're gonna say get random person. I misspelled it, I'm a bad person. Get random person, get random person. Did I misspell it? Get random person. Oh, I didn't define testing, because I'm silly. All right, let's try that again. Cool. Got random people. Notice the first name and last name are different, and the jobs are different. So we've got some random people just popping up all over the place. Cool, now that we have all these helper functions, let's read the file back out. We now have our parse data. Let's add, since this is an array, right? So we'll actually call it what it really is. It's not a parse data, it's our people array. Let's add a random person to it. So we'll say push, get random person, and we'll console log it out, just to verify we know what it is before and after, okay? So we'll say before, after, and then we'll actually write to the file. So we'll copy this guy that we've already got. And we'll put it inside of the callback function. So we'll write the file, right to the exact same place. At this time, we are stringifying the people array. And we wrote it, yo. Cool. So let's test out this guy. Cool, now to update it, we will open our text file to verify. Okay, well we start off with our basic people, three of them, Brainy. Jesse and Cal, they are in there. And we will close node, we will open it again, node. We'll then import our file. We'll then run it and we'll show before it has Jesse, Brainy, and Cal in there. And we've added a random person, so this is what should be saved to the actual text file. So you'll notice if we actually open it, it's, it's written now, that new random person to the bottom. Okay, so Cal117Z is actually there. So congratulations, you've now done the U in CRUD. You've got the create, actually creating files and saving it. You've got the read, reading out the files, and you've got an update. You've got data you've read, modified, and saved back. You've updated it. Great, now let's do the last one, which is delete, which is extremely dangerous. So you have to be careful. Let's make a new file called delete text file, JS. And we will copy our main dude as usual. In this case, we're gonna call it unlink. Unlink just means unlink it from the file system, also known as deleted in theory. I mean, you could read it back, it's technically still there, but whatever. Anyway, we're deleting files. This is very dangerous, so be very careful what you put in this first parameter. You now have uh, become a, a true programmer at this point, so you can destroy things a lot, so just be careful. So in our case, 
we're gonna put dot slash test.txt. So read that twice to make sure you feel comfortable. And if I'm making you feel uncomfortable or nervous, that's a good thing. It means you have a conscience. That's good. It's good to good to feel bad about possibly doing bad things. So error, just in case it broke for whatever reason, if error console.log failed to delete, which is actually okay if the file doesn't exist. We really don't care. Deleted text file bro. Seth. All right. So we will exit out of node. Let's just do it for real. We'll go node. Let's try that again. We'll go node, delete, hit tab. We're gonna run our delete text file. So you'll see that the text file is currently there. We'll hit the unlink run and deleted text file bro Seth. It's now gone. And if we run it again, it should error out because the file doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore. Congratulations, you've now done the D in CRUD. You've got the creation, you got the read, you got the update, and the deletion. You can also delete particular nodes. So a little fuzzy gray line between each one of those, but you've got basic CRUD, well done. Now that's just JSON. Let's do some basic text file parsing as well. So let's create a new one and we'll say parse text file. So we'll do our file system guy again, but in this time, instead of a read file, we'll go to read file and copy pasta coding. Instead of text.txt, let's do parse me. Parse me.txt. And let's create this guy. So we'll go in our text edit here. We'll make it text. And let's go Jesse pipe. Actually, we'll do comma, make things simple. Pipe comma, Jesse Warden, comma, and the job is, what was my job? <laughs> I don't know, I'm feeling in a good mood. We'll say healer. <clears throat> I wanna make, I wanna be the medic. Then we'll hit return, we'll say Brandy, comma, fortune, comma, and she's always the mage. And last one is comma, let's see, cow, moo, and he's the fighter, return. So we'll hit save and save this on the desktop. We'll save this as parseme.txt. Okay, it's, notice it's UTF-8 encoded. Now, this is not JSON, this is just normal text. But I'm gonna show you through basic programming how you can read out and parse things, okay? Now you have to be very, very careful because JSON stringify and parse is native code. Very smart engineers worked really hard to make sure they got you good JSON, nothing weird or bad about it. What we're gonna do is parse it out into stuff that we need. So instead of JSON parse, let's, let's first take a look at what our data looks like. It should be basic text, so let's verify that works. We will run our node parse text file. Plet out, you can see our data is there, it's good to go. What we're gonna do is we're gonna reconstruct this JSON via parsing it into something that we want. We want a JSON object. We don't want this weird text line comma thing, right? We want our original JSON object. Let's first create a person array and we're gonna use this magical function that strings have called split and we will split by the return character, in this case is a slash in or new line character. And then console log out that person array. And let's see what it did. Hit up again, plot out. Cool, so we have an array with each one of the line breaks or return characters. Sometimes it's different on Windows, sometimes on Windows it's slash in, slash r I think, something like that. So in our case we're gonna do slash in and it should bring it out like this. And you'll notice the last one there is empty. So we can clean that up in a couple ways, with code or not having garbage, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So when we rerun it, plot out, we now got a nice clean text file. So, you know, it's it's more about, can I write more code to compensate for bad data or can I work on the bad data which simplifies my code, right? It's more all about the low hanging fruit. And these two strategies you're gonna find extend all throughout your career, okay? So in our case, we have an array of three items. Now, let's convert those to people. Now there are a variety of magical ways you can do all kinds of neat array parsing things. I'm gonna do the basics. I'm not gonna do really array comprehensions or anything fancy. For now we're gonna use basic for loops, okay? So we're gonna say var i. In a future video I'll show you the good stuff. Person array dot length. The length isn't gonna change, so it's safe to use it as an array in dice. I plus plus. I'm gonna start from the beginning, okay? 
clean array, person array. This is where we put our nice and clean parse data. So we're gonna initialize it to empty by default and start adding new things to it. So let's get a person. And in this case, the person array, the first item is this string. Okay, now we can use the split command yet again. Yet again, but instead of a string, we're gonna split on a comma and then add that clean person array, add that at the exact same indice person. And then let's see what we've created so far. So we'll say clean person array, rerun, what do we got? Cool, so we've got an array full of these actual items. You see one, two, and three. First name, last name, and job. The data is all the same order, so we can verify that the first is always the first name, the second is always the last name, and the third is always the job. Not just the job, but the job. Let's parse that a little bit better. In this case, instead of just being an array, we'll make it an object, and we'll say first name is the person First item is the first name. The last name is the second item. And job is the third. Voila, we now have people. Let's clear this out, rerun it. Plot out, we now have people parsed from a text file. Congratulations, you've now done CRUD operations from a read, parsing data that wasn't originally JSON. So you've converted text or parsed it to JSON, something that's useful. You can also do this in return. When you do a lot of I.O. or input-output operations, sometimes you'll take in things from one format and read them to another, and sometimes go back and save it back into the original comma-delimited format. So when you're parsing CSVs or other files that are comma-delimited or pipe-delimited or whatever, that string, that split function can get you a long way. Right? Really, really useful thing for parsing data. You've read and written JSON files. You've parsed a text file. Now there are three remote services I'm gonna show you. Two of which are free, require no configuration, and you're welcome to use as much as you'd like. The other one requires an API key, slightly more complicated setup. Once you sign up, a pin that special key they give you, you can also blast it as much as you want. So the first two are my website. I just have some static text files for you. If you go to jessewardcom slash archive slash text, Dot txt or test.txt, you will see I've got, this is text loaded from a text file from a text-based website full of text. It's all there for you. You can dynamically load it, assuming you are running from Node. Now, if you try to do this in a browser, it's not really gonna work because of security reasons, but an example of how you could actually test it in Node. The other one is JSON, which we're gonna hit right now. So if you go to people.json, sorry about that, 404. You see the same thing we've been doing, it's just remotely. So we're gonna install this request plugin for Node. It allows us to make requests a lot simpler than using the basic stuff that they have. So let me show you how you, how you do that. When you installed Node, it actually came with something else called NPM or Node Package Manager. What that means is instead of going to the random places on the internet and downloading all this code, you can actually install it via command line. It's really simple. It's very, very important as your projects grow, you're gonna to start to have couple, a few, a dozen, hundreds, thousands of these libraries that all link to each other. And NPM helps manage all that for you. So NPM, being familiar with it, I have another video that goes through a crash course of it. Ignore all the pseudo stuff. You shouldn't need that on Windows. On Mac, there's a lot better ways of doing that nowadays. Bottom line is you can run NPM, hit enter, and if you install Node correctly, it should give you all this, these commands that it gives you and things like that. All commands are NPM space and then some command. In our case, we're gonna go NPM, install, right, and make sure you're in your directory, so to verify in Windows DIR, in our case PWD, to make sure you're actually in your basic node folder, okay? This will download code from the internet and put it in the folder for you with the latest version, unless you specify. So in our case, we're gonna say npm install request. It'll go to the interwebs and download the latest version of a quest. Request is just a library written in JavaScript for Node that makes it easier to make requests to other websites and things like that. As soon as it's done, you can ignore all the warnings, errors are the only things that we really care about. You know what works is if you actually go in there and look, you'll see a node modules folder. So all the code that it downloaded for the internet is now there for you. You open it up, it has 50 billion gazillion folders, right? They all link to each other. A lot of these modules, each one does one thing small and really simply. Request tends to borrow a lot of them and they all link to each other. So don't worry about it, it's all node modules. 
you'll know if it worked because you can then go node, enter, say var testing equals require and without any dot slash just request. If you do it like this, it means look in the global node modules, either global in your computer or in the node modules folder locally. If you do the dot slash, it's looking for your file. So in our case, we're looking globally in the node modules folder, hit enter, then type in the word testing, and it should show you this big old object. You're good to go. You can now make requests to any website you want without security restrictions. That's what's great about node. So we're gonna make a new file. We're gonna save it as testing remote data JS. We will save in our basic node. Now, to use it, we'll just do the same thing we did before. Request equals require request. Right, good to go. Console log it out to verify she's good to go. In this case, we'll exit out of node and say, yo, node, can you run the testing remote data JS file? Pull it out, it actually prints out the function, so we're good to go. Now, let's use it to load these URLs. In this case, let's start with the text file on my website, something simple from a remote website running from my computer. My website is actually, believe it or not, hosted in California. They might have a grid server east of us. I'm not really sure, but originally 15 billion years ago, I signed up out there. So it's making a request from where I'm at in Richmond over to there. And this is what Node allows us to do. It doesn't care about domains, doesn't whatever. It's gonna go get a text file from over there. There are a variety of different requests. We're only gonna talk about two. The ones that you care about are Git and Post. Now, if you think about REST APIs, RESTful APIs, they just mean that a URL can actually go and get some data. They've modeled it after CRUD operations, really. Git is kind of like a read. Post is a write or delete. It just depends on how you interpret that. So they're supposed to match the CRUD, but everyone abuses them. So good news is Gits are almost always reads. So if you do a Git, you're reading data. Good to go. So when we make a get request, the other good thing about a get request is you can test them in your browser. So for example, this is a get request. Get me some text data. This is also a get request. Get me a people JSON. Now sometimes when you go to Google, it appears to be a get request because you can type in google.com, right, and hit enter, and it gives you a website. But there may be some post calls in the background that are sending information to track and things like that. In our case, we're just gonna get some text from a remote server. So get, read from the crud, same thing. So when I say request, this cool little object slash function thing does all kinds of goodies. One is git. Now git takes a bunch of parameters. So let's let's start creating an object for the first one. The first one is the URL. Where are we going? Well, in our case, we're going there to get the text file, okay? And that's really it. That's all we care about. The second parameters are, all right, when it, when it gets it, I'll give you the response. So I'm not gonna give you the data I'm gonna give you the HTML response. When you make HTML requests and responses and posts, there's all kinds of stuff wrapped around those. They get sliced up into little itty bitty packets and they all go about their merry way to go to the server and then they all come back and bounce over other servers and come back to you, right? Pretty, pretty cool, sophisticated stuff behind the scenes. All you care about is, can I get a text file? Your text file is buried in this object I gave you back, right? So that's what a response is. Request, you send. Response, you get back. In our case, our function is gonna get a callback function, just like everything in Node. Error, and the last part is the response. But there's also a body, the body of the response of what you got back. Now the body will actually give us the contents of whatever we load, the JSON document, the text file, images, like whatever you load, the body's actually gonna be there and what we need. So let's check for an error just in case. If we can't reach the website for whatever reason, log it out. An abort, abort. Now, assuming it is JSON, it's our people array, right? As a JSON string, so we should, in theory, be able to parse it back out. However, I've created some incorrect JSON on purpose to show you what happens when you attempt to parse things. This happens all the time in parsing. You attempt to parse things and things break. Seeing errors is a very common thing. It's not scary, it's just expected. And your job is to work through it and figure out those parse errors to get the data you want and clean it up and expect those parse errors to happen, right? Make it solid, make it strong. Now, one thing to note is parse errors are very common. You're gonna spend a lot of your time debugging parse errors. It doesn't always work out of the box. Good news is if it's JSON, there's a lot of common things people do and you can debug those. So you'll see this stack trace it gives you. It's very similar to the ones you get in the browser and it says unexpected token F. 
all JSON files are expected to stringify everything. When I mean stringify, I mean even the property names need to have quotes around them. It's no longer JavaScript, right? It's no longer an object with a value of any data type, a number, a date, an object, an array, whatever. So in our case, we actually have to fix our exported JSON. So if we go to here, you'll notice that the JSON has no strings around the first name, last name, and jobs. So let's fix that. I'm gonna save that text file, reopen it to the website. We are gonna go into first name and add some quotes to everything. We now have double quotes for everything. We rerun our parser. And we now have an unexpected token on one we missed, right? So we even fixed everything, but we missed one particular token on this guy. And it's smart enough to detect it. So you'll notice a lot of parsing errors are digging through mounds and mounds of text and trying to find things where they are. This is where find and replace in a really good fast text editor like Adam, Sublime, Visual Studio Code, Text Edit, VI, <laughs> Vim, whatever. Those kind of things, Emacs, they allow you to deal with mounds and mounds of text very quickly to find these kinds of data issues that you're dealing with. Third time's the charm. Reload and hey look, the browser detected it was JSON. So I have a JSON plugin installed for my Chrome extension that allows me to actually read JSON files format them if they're really long. And if it detects it's valid JSON, it'll parse it. If it fails, it gives up. In my case, my code shows an error. Theirs just says, well, it looks like text, I guess. But if they detect that it, it's good looking JSON, it'll parse it for you and show it on the screen all nice. So we can tell our stuff's good. We can see the double quotes, good to go, funky comatina. So when we rerun our parser, plot out, right? We've got our JSON as normal and a length of three. So you can parse remote data as well using request. So let's, we've done text, we've done JSON and parsed it out. Let's do some weather. Let's actually hit a random web service in some other place and actually parse that data out, right? So we can get some weather. So we're gonna create a new file here. We're gonna save this as our API. We're creating an application programming interface, .js, right? You're creating an API in JS. Welcome to the server world. You can now put full stack on your resume. Have you dealt with Mongo or NoSQL databases lately? No. Well, then how are you full stack? Because Jesse told me to. Of course they did. I'm Jesse Wooden, I want you to succeed. I want you to crush. All right, so we're gonna do module exports. We're gonna give ourselves an API in our API. Yo, dog, I heard you like APIs. Let's put an API in your API so you could, you could code while you code. Access data request while you request. Hmm, let's say get weather, get weather. Okay, what does this get weather do? Well, get weather will go to this random website. So I'm gonna sign up with you and show you how the process goes. So if you go to openweathermap.org, they have an API that you can access, but you have to have a key. They don't want people spamming them. So they use these API keys to do it. So you can sign up. I'm gonna sign in with my stuff. As you can see, once you're in, down here, you'll see this API key. It actually use this to append to the get URLs. Now remember, gets have a certain special way of doing variables, which I'll show you in get URLs. When you're dealing with remote data, it's all about the get variables of the post. Posts are this little packet that's sent behind the scenes in those headers, so you don't see it. But anytime you go to a website and you see weird things like this, foo equals bar, ampersand, cow equals moo, ampersand, jesse, age equals 36, right? All those variables start with a question mark and every single one out there is an ampersand, ampersand, ampersand. Remember string.split, right? We did the same thing. So on the back end, that's how they parse it off and they have the key and the value, right? Key is what the name of the variable is and the value is actually what it equals. So in our case, we can part deduce that foo equals bar, cal equals moo, and Jesse's age equals 36. In our case, we're gonna actually access their API page and use this API to let them know that we have permission to hit it. So if we start abusing it, they know which key to turn off, right? They don't have to worry about IP addresses and all that other crap. They just can use the API key, okay? So this key allows you to access their system. It's like wearing a, a collared shirt in some of the fancy clubs. Who dances in collared shirts? This guy, that too. Now, if you click the API button, they have all kinds of wonderful APIs. The API doc, for current weather data for one particular location. Notice that the only variable they have is the queue or query equals where it is. 
In this case, they've documented query equals city name or city and country code. In my case, it's gonna be Richmond, Virginia. Just merely append app ID, all uppercase, as a variable, equals whatever the key that they gave you. So every single one of these get your calls, you're gonna do that. So I'm gonna use mine for now to show you how it works. Do our request again. We're gonna request things, require. I can't spell today. Request. We're gonna request get. We're gonna give ourselves a callback since this is gonna take a while, a few seconds, a few milliseconds. The first and only parameter is the URL, right? The weather.com URL API. So for now, I'm gonna put the app ID, whatever that key is that I have. Now the URL is kind of big, so I wanna show you how to do the variable first, right? I do an ampersand. So let's get the URL as a variable, since it's kind of big, I want it to fit on the screen. Notice I've already got two parameters here. I've got the query, which is Richmond, Virginia, it's where I live, and the units are Imperial because my country smokes crack. So we currently use Imperial, sorry to hear that. We're not metric and cool like the rest of the world, but we're getting there. That's your URL, let's append this app ID to it. So we'll, when you're appending variables, notice you use the ampersand. It always starts with a question mark, but every time we're after, it's these little ampersand guys or ands. Copy pasted the app ID, so it's kind of long, right? But we can just match the variable, good to go. Now, for the callback, remember the callback has three parameters. The first is the error, if there is one. The response, which is big and complicated. And the body, what did you actually send me back? So let's check it out. Let's see what it sent me back. The body is this. Now, I'm not gonna log out error. I'm not really interested. We'll go node get our testing actually let's say api for now since we're we're smart we know what it we know what we're doing oh can't find module api let's try that again i'm not talking about a global i'm calling a dot slash my api uh oh i got a parsing error because i can't parse now same thing as a parse error in the browser if you mess up your javascript it's going to not even run it. it's gonna say hey dude i can't even parse this so we're gonna fix our url here to not have a semicolon Clear it out, then rerun. There we go. Now our API should have one and only function, which is get weather. We're gonna pass it a callback, but first I just want to see if it even worked. So I don't care about a callback. Let's just let's just run it. API dot get weather. Let's see what it does. Cool, it gave us a JSON response back. How cool is that? Oh, it gave us the coordinates of latitude and longitude where I am on the planet Earth. The weather, which has all kinds of, it's an um, it's an array, but it has all kinds of objects in there, like what's what's the weather type, what's the description, if you actually wanted to show this on like some kind of little dashboard somewhere. The icon that they actually supply, this icon ID is how you can load images from their servers. And all kinds of other neat things. All we care about is this temp. So this is a little hard to read. So let's take this out and go into something called a JSON formatter. There's a variety of these on the internet. The first one that comes up is the one I use because it's the first one. Copy, paste, hit process, and it'll format it for you. Cool, so a lot easier to read. The one we're concerned about is not the cord weather, but we care about main, in this case, temp. So what is the temperature right now? So let's go and parse this out like we normally would anything else. Say weather data, JSON parse the body. Cool, we have weather data. And let's console log the weather data dot main dot temp to see the temperature so weather data dot main dot temp we'll reload it again close node reimport our api run our get weather function and then what wow, there we go now we've got an exact numeric representation of the current temperature notice that it says 0.24 you've now parsed an external api to get the temperature from your current location. Now you can change these variables to where you live. You can change them to all kinds of other places. And it'll give you the current temperature there as quick as they update. I don't know how often they update, but it's pretty cool. You've now accessed a remote external API. That's fantastic. Let's now call that callback with the data of the temperature. So in this case, it's weather data dot main dot temp. So this will give you the temperature. So let's rename it to something that makes more sense. Get temperature in Richmond, Virginia. Learn how to spell, homie. Whoosh. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called refactoring. It's when you change code that already works to do something slightly different that you want. Now, if there is an error, let's log it out. Error. 
call the callback with an error, and then return. Good to go. So we'll abort, send the error back. So this guy can actually send a callback to say, hey, when you're done loading things, it'll let me know, right? Now you're seeing how all the other node APIs work. They do something that takes a while, and then they call callback when they're done. We just did the same thing. Now we've covered callbacks before in my other video. You can take a look if you forget. Congratulations, you've now hit three APIs remotely. You've hit my simple text one, my simple JSON one, they're both gets. But you've also hit an API that provides data and parsed out to get what you want from it, so from third party service. So Node allows you to do this. You can write JavaScript just like you had before. Using this request module makes things a lot simpler to do get requests. So you can do posts as well. Now it seems like there's more to it, but there's not. The majority of your career dealing with remote data as a front end developer is dealing with that JSON. And if you eventually get in the Node, and write your own web services to get data and orchestrate it, right? All that stuff is JSON and mounds and mounds of JSON. Ah. And that's your majority of your career is dealing with buckets of JSON coming everywhere. So once you get down with the basics of that, everything else is just building on top of that parsing and loading concepts that you learned today. Congratulations, you've now consumed all those APIs. That's how you get remote data. Again, thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. And if you got any other questions, hit me up in the comments. I'll post all this code up on GitHub. It'll be in the description so you can refer to it and ask questions. And thanks for your time and hope this helped. Good luck.